Um, good afternoon. I'm Kyla McFarlane, Curator of Australian Art here um, at Kwagoma. And um, before we begin, I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we stand um, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, thank you for joining us here on this extremely hot day where it's really nice and air-conditioned inside and um, Christian's just got off a plane um, at um, APT8 Live Sundays um, and this is the first instalment of what is going to be a few um, discussions of in the APT8 Live discussion forum which will explore the breadth of contemporary performance in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and I just need to note that APT Live is supported by the Commonwealth through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, I've also just been handed a copy of this publication, which is the APT um, catalogue, and um, I recommend it highly. Um, Judy, how much is it? Um, $39.95. $39 it's a bargain too, so um, pick one up. Okay, so today we're joined by our special guest, Christian Thompson, APT8 artist, and Sarah Rodigardi, um, who's an artist, curator, and writer for a discussion on how contemporary performance art operates in the context of an art museum. Kristen Thompson is an artist of Bajara Heritage, who works across video, photography, sculpture, performance, and sound. Thompson's interested in the performative and his works frequently present him adopting various personas created with costumes, adornments and disguises derived from history and tradition. Thompson grew up in an urban environment in the 1980s and 90s and he interweaves references to Bajara culture such as gestures and songs with elements of pop culture to address issues of colonialism, sexuality and cultural representation. Christian's most recent body of work was inspired by an archive of historical photographs of Aboriginal people held at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. It constitutes a contemporary response to themes of the archive, spiritual repatriation and cultural hybridity. And a suite of Christian's photographs from the Polari series is in APT8, accompanied by a video of the artist performing in the Bidjara language. And Christian also performed for us on our opening weekend. So Sarah, Sarah Rodigari creates performances that address economies of exchange pertaining to socio-political engagement, shared authorship, and a new, a new institutional critique. Working at the intersections of theater, visual art, and social practice, her method is responsive and context-specific. Recent projects take the form of lecture, text, video, collaboration, and curation. Rodigari has presented work at the MCA, the Melbourne International Arts Festival, the South Project in Indonesia, Pact Zolverein in Germany, the Centre for Contemporary Art in Glasgow, the National Review of Live Art in the UK, the Anti-Contemporary Arts Festival in Finland, and SOMA in Mexico City. Sarah has a BA with Honours in Sociology from the University of New South Wales, Masters in Fine Art from RMIT, and is currently a PhD candidate in Creative Art at University of Wollongong. And after those extensive biographies, please welcome our guests. <laughs> I just wanted to um, begin this conversation just by sort of putting us in the context of APT8 Live, which is all around us um, this weekend, which really does engage with performance in the museum space um, and across the course of the exhibition um, as a whole with these APT8 Live um, kind of discussion and performance um, events um, that are happening monthly. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that we have projects um, within the APT Live um, part of the show which are both um, ephemeral and temporal, but which also have sculptural and moving image presence. Um, there's performances video, performances lecture, um, there's sculptural interventions ready to be activated, um, for example. And just even across the different events today, um, you know, we have Rosanna Raymond's Savage Club, um, which is activated today. It's a space of community and reclamation of a gentleman's club and its collected objects. 
um, you would have maybe partaken um, with Supercritical Mass or, or seen their fantastic um, workshop um, performances um, where they use the museum as a site of exploration and activity through sound and, and um, temporary community. Um, and also have the sculptural presence um, of the instrument and video um, element of their work as well. Um, Gabriella Mangano and Silvana Mangano have also kind of worked between video um, and, their, and performance in their work, There Is No There, which was um, performed this afternoon. So there's this kind of interesting tension between you know, what is performance in the gallery and, and how that, that operates. I just wanted to kind of lay that out as a little context for us. Um, and of course there's Christian's own forays into you know, <coughs> performance, video and um, photography. I think that um, Sarah and Christian have like two really interesting and quite um, diverse engagements with this kind of really fertile ground around um, performance in the museum and the objects inside it and, and outside the museum as well. Um, so I thought it would be good if you could both tell us something of the context which you, you come from, because it's, it's quite different, the, um, the places where, you know, from which you emerge to come into this practice. Sarah, I think you, I mean, the idea of sociology as performance is, is really key for you. Yeah, <clears throat> just loud there. So, um, <laughs> hi everybody. Um, so I come from, I think in terms of my background that I don't often think about or what kind of started me on a trajectory towards performance was that I was studying sociology and experimental theatre practices at the same time in Sydney and um, that has largely influenced the way in which I make work and I don't really come from a visual arts history and so I've moved I guess I've moved. Be I move between that, and I work between um, performance spaces and visual art spaces. And I also have, in recent years, kind of I choose not to claim either or. Like I just like to be between them. Performance spaces offer me a really different way of making work. And when I worked in performance spaces, or when I do work in performance spaces, I don't really know how to work in a black box, and nor do I particularly know how to work in a white cube. So often I also, for a period of time, worked outside of that. Um, so would, making work that would be, I guess, in public space or supposed public space, um, it kind of where, where I'd seek kind of funding, not that didn't necessarily come through government funding, but through kind of um, collective forms of resourcing um, through arts organisations like Field Theory, um, which is a collective based in Melbourne that kind of, for a number of years, generated their own income by creating like a subscription structure for um, being part of an artwork. So you could subscribe to an artwork and in response the, art, the artist would send you something out of what they'd make. Which is very difficult for me, which also comes to the other thing that I don't have much of um, a history in making objects. Uh, and I don't really, I'm not sure about the term ephemeral in, in terms of my practice either. I'm always confused about that because there is documentation of my work, but usually there's just like one photograph. Um, and more often than not, as the years have progressed, that one photograph, which you might see here today, is just of me standing around talking, so it's not that interesting. <laughs> so I often wonder about, so those elements of like documentation and recording the work, I've started to kind of move on and into different forms, which maybe come from a sociological perspective of, I've started to write about my practice or invite other people to write around my practice or open it up for um, a discursive space where usually it's just some kind of idea that I'm talking about and then I invite people to respond to it. Um, so it's this, I'm particularly interested in the relationship between audience and the artwork that's being produced and, I'm, and that's, that's the space that is my kind of main focus as opposed to say an, an object outcome or in a traditional notion of theatre, um, a kind of narrative trajectory. And Christian, you come from a much more of a visual arts background, don't you? Mm -hmm. Can you just sort of describe a bit of that and, and then we'll go into talking about actual works of, of both of these, yeah. Yeah, well my background is sort of sculpture. I sort of studied, um, you know, majored in sculpture in my undergrad and then honours and um, my masters <laughs> and that, that's sort of been my, um, sort of formal training, but um, there was always a kind of performative kind of mm. aspect 
to it. And then I sort of moved closer and closer to performance over the years. So firstly, it started as sort of wearable sculptures, and I'd photograph people wearing the sculptures, and then I would make sort of video works, and then I started doing live sort of street kind of performances, then I was in bands, and then I was actually as a sessional teacher at the Victorian College of the Arts, and that's when um, Das Arts, who's a, um, a, um, a school, a theatre school in Amsterdam, they were doing a residency there, and I sort of became the kind of 11th member of that um, group of people, and then they, um, I sort of had been sort of, I guess, trying to summon the courage to actually bring my sort of physical body more into the, into the, um, into the art context. Um, and it was sort of naturally going in that direction mm. anyway. But then that was just a kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of fate just ended up taking me there. And they said, look, if you can find the application form on the website, you know, you're in. <laughs> and so I applied and then I went to Amsterdam and had an interview and then moved there and then that was much more of a theatre kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, much more, of a, it was much more sort of theatre based, but also, you know, Amsterdam has a very um, diverse kind of range of different schools and so it was a very cross fertile kind of environment. So for me it was about sort of adapting my primarily sort of photographic practice into a kind of theatre mm. sort of context and, and making the kind of images move and so my my solo um, tree of knowledge really is a series of images that have a performative action in them that are kind of sewn together and that's a, a cryptic kind of musical as well because mm. I sort of carry a CD player around on stage and I sort of introduce backing tracks and then I'll sing over the top or I'll dance over the top of them or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's how I sort of ended up making Doing what you do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also I think the idea of sort of, um, you know, presenting them in, you know, in the theatre context, it's all there and, you know, you know the sort of um, framework and the context is very much set for the work. And I sort of had to learn the hard way in terms of presenting my theatre performances mm. in a visual arts context where, you know, I would be presenting the work and people would just be walking in and out with a glass of sort of champagne <laughs> and I was just kind of going, uh, you can't really do that. So, um, <laughs> you could just sit still. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so then I sort of had to be really quite sort of, um, I guess, um, you know, I had to be really um, strict about the context and the, mm. you know, um, the sort of rules and regulations of what I was presenting. Yeah, work, sure. Because there's nothing more sort of unsettling as a performer if you're performing and people are just kind of milling about around you, whereas in the theatre context, you can't really just get up and walk in and out of a sort of performance. Yeah. We'll come back to Tree of Knowledge too later on, or we can talk more about um, that context. Um, Sarah, I think strategies for leaving and arriving home is a really great. Um, oh, you off, Christian? We could just going. have a moment to adjust. It's getting lost in my mind. I'll go through these <laughs> slides. Um, Sarah, I wonder if you can talk to us about strategies for <coughs> leaving and arriving home, because I think. Um, this really plays out that tension um, in your work of that um, being outside and also inside the institution. It's got quite an interesting story, this work, just even from you know, its conception to its um, attempt to be co-opted into the museum. Yep, sure. So this is Strategies for Living and Arriving Home. It's my kind of one token image. I've got a few others, but... There is that thing of, again, um, a picture of a woman walking. Um, basically, I walked from Melbourne to Sydney uh, in June of 2011. I relocated from Melbourne to Sydney after living in Melbourne for 10 years. I moved back to Sydney. And it felt really traumatic for me. I liked Melbourne. If anyone's been to Melbourne, I mean, I hear it's the most livable city. It's pretty nice. There's no reason to leave. Um, <laughs> And Sydney, not so much. And so, um, <laughs> anyway, so I decided that I had to move back to Sydney. And, um, but it was also at this time that I had just finished doing a, a massive public art commission, which allowed me to essentially like quit my day job and, and live my dream as an artist, which was to make this kind of large scale public artwork that was interactive and it was just like a dream come true. And it was like a nightmare. And, I felt completely instrumental um, 
more instrumentalized in relation to how I was working. Um, and of course, there's lots of stuff written about that um, since then and since that kind of shift from like when relational practices kind of move into institutions, then who are the relational practices for? And, and so I started to think about that, but not in relation to uh, necessarily the institution, but in relation to myself. Like, why on earth am I making this type of work? And why do I value it more than any other form of work? Or why did I at the time? So I decided that I would... This is my... I call this, like, my Susan Lacey, because I'm, like, leaving art. And so I, I pack a... Like, a day pack. I think I have, like, 10 kilos on me. And I walk... It's a solo work, walk along the highway from Melbourne to Sydney. Uh, in which I kind of live and camp and blog and invite people to join me. I call it like a participatory artwork. I really had this idea that like farmers would just like hop off their tractors and join me and we would like talk about life. Um, I really <laughs> didn't thought happen. nothing, nothing no. happened. No, I, just to clarify, absolutely nothing happened. I lost two kilos in case anyone's wondering because that was like, that's a very important question. Um, I didn't really even need to wear all those kind of outdoorsy clothes. I could have just worn jeans and would have been m a much better aesthetic photo for future documentation of my artwork. Didn't think about that. Um, so I blogged along the way and I had no injuries. Like, everything was fine. It was so boring. It was excruciating. People came and walked with me, which was really nice. And um, In fact, I didn't get much time to myself. There was no, like, kind of wanderlust moments there. It was just kind of tedious. But what, what plays out in the work is what I think is interesting in terms of thinking about as a social engaged project is that it becomes, it all has since become kind of mythologized. Like this is, sometimes I think it's like that work that won't go away where I'll run into somebody like a few years later at a conference who says, oh yes, I followed your blog, and then they'll start telling me what they think. And so I realised after a number of years that it's far more interesting when people tell me what they think the walk was about and what it represented for them. It's far more interesting when somebody says it means this, it means that. You're like suturing the, the relationship between Melbourne and Sydney. And so I think of it, <laughs> I think of myself then here is this kind of idea of a conduit. Um, and I think about this kind of idea of sympathetic magic um, of all I'm doing is just this vessel for imagining or thinking or repositioning yourself so I could have actually just hauled up an Aubrey and like you know hung out at the RSL for a few weeks blogged and then come home would have been fine <laughs> um, so there's no documentation of the work there is the blog which is a bit odd I don't know where that is now though hopefully disappeared um, and then what happened, I think there's a few videos that have t taken on like my iPhone 3 of me trying to cross into um, private property as I get towards the outskirts of um, Sydney where I can't, cl I'm trying to climb walls and I'm also like a city slicker so it was just like a awkward, everything was awkward. <laughs> um, and then uh, maybe a couple of years ago, um, Mama in, Mel in Melbourne were doing this exhibition about art as verb and they said, we'd like to show this work and I said, no, no. I don't show that work, it only exists in, in, as a concept. Like, it, there's only, like, I, I don't know how I would exhibit it, and, and then, I, then I pitched every other artwork that I had, and they said, no thanks. And actually, Sarah, can I just jump in here? Because uh, in case you don't know this show, Art is a Verb is basically, you know, art is doing, and it's, it's talking about that relationship mm. um, and trying to kind of co-op that in a interesting way into the museum, yeah. Just in case anyone doesn't know that project, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is an underlying toe of me thinking about like what matters to me as an artist, what, what do I do, what's my role, how do I contribute to the world? Um, all this idea of like embodied action that kind of comes through this. And so the way that I've documented it is, is, is there's a chapter in a, in a book, a sociological book about um, travel and transformation and I've written about it there. Um, but other than that, there's that, and now there's this now there's this exhibition <laughs> that it's a part of. So what was a real struggle for me was then how to then represent the work that I didn't really want to be represented, other than talked about. Um, and so now it just exists, obviously, like as a, as a photograph and an essay. There's an essay on the back of it, um, and I think if I got it together, that would be available online somewhere as well. Like I wouldn't. I don't think of it in that way, but that felt like a really roundabout trip for that artwork of me kind of moving away from working with any arts organisations 
to wanting to kind of see myself as this, not quite outsider, because I don't really know if that's possible, but just I just wanted to figure it out again. So, um, And I still hold in me this terrible kind of romantic, modernist, um, avant-garde idea of what an artist can be and does, even though I inherently don't believe in it. I, so that's my constant struggle. I don't know if anyone else has that. But yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like, in retrospect, maybe, that that show positioned you within a history of practice that, you know, wouldn't have been the case had it just stayed outside, completely outside of the museum? Yeah, it would have. I mean, I almost said no, so I almost just went, mm. well, I don't think we can reach an agreement here. And then it was that negotiation that a friend of mine said, but you should just do it, it's good to have, it's good to be positioned with an in institution, it's good to be archived in this way. And I, of course, I never think about that, and so now I'm starting to think about that. Now I'm think all I think about is how I can be archived. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> You're in there now. <laughs> And Kristen, yeah, just sort of leading on from, um, you know, Sarah's kind of dragged kicking and screaming into the museum, um, but now she's kind of, you know, thinking differently about it. I wanted to um, ask you about a couple of your projects that combine um, performance and um, photography, which, you know, you're very well known for photography, um, and as well as the cultural archive um, and the collection, which I think is a really interesting segue um, kind of between the object in the museum and, and the performative um, work that you do, which is the um, starting off with your work of the Pitt Rivers um, Museum. Mm -hmm. I'll just flick a couple of those. More pictures of Sarah <laughs> talking. <laughs> we'll come back to those. <laughs> <Change. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> um, our slides are a bit out of order. Here we are. I'll just flick through a few of these images while you're talking. Yeah, um, in 2010, I um, took up my candidature at um, the University of Oxford to do my doctorate. And it coincided with an Australian Research Council grant project, which was looking at the sort of repatriation of Australian photographs in European collections in um, France, England, the UK, and the Netherlands. Um, and so they invited me to sort of do this project, which was kind of the sort of visual response to um, the Pitt Rivers Museum Australian Photographic um, Archive. And I was really conscious of not sort of re-displaying the kind of objects and, you know, sort of, I guess Fred Wilson is a classic example. You know, he sort of really set a precedent for the sort of artist museum um, sort of collaboration. But um, I was really interested in how I could sort of move past that and also was looking at sort of how to sort of circumnavigate sort of cultural sensitivities about redisplaying images mm. of deceased people, which was um, something that was really important for me to, to sort of try to, um, to um, you know, deal with. Um, and, um, yeah, I started thinking about this idea of spiritual repatriation, which was a, a term that I sort of coined in terms of moving it away from the kind of um, sort of temporal and making it more sort of about the corporeal. Um, and so I really just went to the collection on several different occasions and mm. really meditated on the images. So it was interesting that you talked about the idea of being a conduit or a medium or sort of channeling sort of, um, you know, sort of different... Theme. So for me, it was more about sort of how do I, you know, make the collection part of my experience while I was doing my doctorate and then mm. l allowing that to kind of um, inspire the body of work. And so the really early sort of experiments were really completely nothing like this. That I was, you know, painted purple when I had pink flowers on my head and they were just com not like this. But sort of after a while, the, the collection really started to sort of permeate my sort of process, and I think as an artist, that's something you kind of learn over time. It's something you also have to sort of trust mm. um, instinctively that you know that um, you know life is you know the, your experience is the real kind of studio. That's where the, the sort of real concepts come from, and mm. that uh, you know just kind of um, emerged in this series called "We Bury Our Own," which was looking at this idea of um, you know I, I like the concept of 
bringing people into the world and then performing a kind of ceremonial act that allowed the images to take on a new kind of form as a new form of sort of cultural um, capital mm. that was able to sort of um, transcend the museum context or the ethnographic kind of inscription or definition of those images. I think that idea of the ceremonial act is really important too in this project as a whole, isn't it? Because um, you've talked about um, the idea of um, the objects, the kinds of objects that are collected in places like the Pitt Rivers um, Museum um, are actually, you know, originally ceremonial objects that have a completely different function. Um, you know, it's more of a votive function mm -hmm. and that's something that you brought into the work? Yeah, I mean, I was sort of attracted to lots of different aspects of the museum and I don't know if anyone's actually sort of been to the Pitt Rivers Museum, but it's really kind of what museums were like at the turn of the kind of last century. So objects are sort of displayed in vitrines and they're not displayed by um, sort of cultural group. They're just displayed by object. object. So all this material from all over the world is kind of, you know, um, there'll just be one vitrine full of baskets, one vitrine full of, you know, musical instruments, one vitrine full of smoking things, and, um, you know, it's quite sort of, um, you know. <laughs> Is it topological rather than It's just objects based else? on yeah. objects, so um, there's this real sort of mishmash of, of material, actually a lot of the material actually comes from the Queen's Trust, so it's seized at border control and then given to the University of Oxford and then put on display, so they have a lot of <laughs> right. ivory and a lot of things like that as well. But um, I was really attracted to the sort of English folklore material, um, which were these really kind of bizarre objects, which were sort of, you know, ox hearts pounded with nails or, you know, a slug that was impaled on a thorn or, um, mole's feet that had been <laughs> severed off and put in a box, and that was a cure for toothache. Um, so thank God for Sensodyne. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, so I was really interested in these objects because they were kind of just so banal and just so odd, but they were also really votive, and it also sort of tapped into the kind of history of England as something that sort of was, sort of, you know, kind of neo, uh, sort of pre-Christian, pagan kind of ceremonies and rituals, and I, I sort of saw a, a kind of connection there and that's mm. why I wanted to really allow the collection to kind of inspire the work and so a lot of the materials are natural materials like butterflies and crystals and um, you know flowers and candle you know all different kinds of um, sort of um, materials and do you see but I was also interested okay. in sort of transforming the space into a kind of meditative space as well so people knew that it was sort of collected you know connected to the museum collection but it was it was sort of sat outside of it even though it was inside the museum at the same time so mm. yeah. and it's interesting too isn't it that they're photographic objects but they are performative you you perform those photos which is a really important thing for you isn't it that that aspect yeah i mean it's also kind of autobiographical and i sort of use mm. the the oxford sort of sub fusk which is this formal sort of oxford kind of um Dress. Dress, yep. Um, and I thought, well, I sort of want it to be connected to my experience as well. I don't want it to be sort of completely abstract from that. So, um, just scrolling through. Um, I also, um, when we talked earlier about, you know, um, this trajectory into, from performance into photography, and it's interesting that you've mentioned your sculptural background as well, I think it's quite good to um, mention emotional strip cheese, which is a really, it's a much earlier project, but um, in that project, you're, yeah, 2003, so um, in that sense, the museum becomes this kind of, perhaps like a conduit between you and objects and subjects that are then performed into photographs. Would that be an accurate description of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I was working at the Melbourne Museum when I made that body of mm. work, so it is sort of connected to my sort of lived experience as well, but I was interested in, interested in the sort of historical, um, you know, studio portraiture, and I was thinking how I could reinvent that and turn it into something that sort of created a context for people to be able to participate in what I sort of saw at the time as the kind of, um, you know, the 
a very few Indigenous people get to participate in this sort of art making process. And I saw my practice as a kind of um, context to invite people to sort of participate in the work. Um, and that was sort of after I did a series of giant sweaters as well that sort of had sort of really generic kind of indigenous designs on them. And I also got friends to model in those works as well. Sarah, coming, um, just kind of folding you back into the um, conversation and, and kind of taking a bit of a turn, I, um, I think that um, speech, the idea of speech and, and language is really important to both your practices, even though, you know, we've seen that um, Christian's perhaps, you know, more engaged with the object and, and the museum um, itself and bringing performance into, you know, photography um, and video. But you both have a really strong connection to language and speech, um, which plays out quite differently between you. Um, so can you tell us about um, perhaps a filibuster of dreams, which is... Um, a very lengthy engagement with the idea of speech. Um, <clears throat> sure. So I also have this kind of I'll get little there. known background <laughs> in, in mime, corporeal mime, that I did for years. And I didn't talk at all. I just do like mime on stage. Um, oh, here we are. So I feel like um, talking is something that I've always found very difficult to do. And also performing in my own work I found really difficult. So. I've been, since the walk, I've been almost like anything that I think is like going to be excruciating, I make myself do. And so a filibuster of dreams um, was, I think, maybe, I think 11 hours, maybe 10, 10 hours, either way. Um, it's a 10 hour toast uh, that takes place in a town hall in Melbourne. It's also kind of streamed online. And again, it, there's a call out to, um, to audiences or a general public to make requests. Um, and they can request anything they want. They can just request a toast, that I would make a toast on their behalf um, into the night kind of thing. And if they don't, if no one makes a request, and I think maybe 20 people did, uh, then I just spend the rest of the night doing it on their behalf for them. So it's, uh, there's, it's loosely based around a structure of every hour there's a new topic. And then um, I work a lot with improvisation as well. So it's, there's a series of toasts that happen for 11 hours straight based on topics where I'm just giving unconditional positive regard to whatever the situation might be. So um, I also had um, some of that might be the entire content of my address book where I just toasted everyone and anyone in my address book, which could have been like, you know, info at like mattress collectors. And I would toast them. And, and so it was just this constant, relentless kind of giving of thanks, which has this idea of ritual and meditation to it. Um, but also there's this, it's tied, I think, into this idea of a, a filibuster in, in an American kind of political sense. We don't really have them here, I don't think. No, um, I don't think. Uh, is that idea that, you know, if you can't, if you absolutely can't stand something, um, it's like your last, it's your last stand. You make a stand for it, you stand up and you talk until there's a potential change to that bill. And, or at least that bill is then kind of, um, what is it, like held back? Uh, maybe for the weekend, and then it's changed anyway on Monday or something like that. There's a, there's, there's a tragedy in filibusters that I find deeply romantic in the same way that there's a tragedy in endurance performance that I also feel lends itself to a kind of theatrical form. So um, the idea was that I just talked nonstop. Every hour I had a song. Um, I think on this occasion I had any rendition I could find to help me make it through the night, also excruciating. Um, <laughs> And uh, what happens is, I guess what's interesting is not necessarily the content, the content again, like the toasting isn't particularly interesting and me talking certainly isn't that interesting, but the complete debacle that unfolds through my fatigue is, I think, fascinating to watch um, if anyone is watching it. Um, and uh, I guess fortunately, unfortunately, um, people stayed throughout the night, so I had beds laid out in the town hall for people to kind of come and sleep on if they wanted to. And then people could watch it on the 
internet, which I also completely forgot about. So then people would tweet in saying, oh yes, that comment. And it, so I'd just be saying anything. It was just terrible. Like it was that kind of awkward. It wasn't terrible in like a bad sense of, it was, I'm, I meant to kind of diminish the artwork, but it became excruciating. Everything that came out of my mouth was just, I wish I hadn't said that. Almost like just then. Like, <laughs> um, Is this one of the reasons why you don't document your work perhaps? <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I mean, this is heavily documented. Um, there's, a, there's 11 hours of footage I'm not going to watch. Um, Would you show that in a museum context when Mama calls you up for their next show? <laughs> um, is this a proposal? <laughs> <laughs> Um, potentially, I mean, I would like to, I, if, because it's a challenge for me, I would think about it. Um, there are some kind of beautiful moments where in the middle of the night, a cat walked into the theatre, which was incredible, because I was toasting to all the cats in the world, and then one appeared. Or did that really happen? Who knew? Like, it became kind of quite intense. Um, but I've, I guess I've, again, in terms of speech, or the ideas of speech, uh, if I think of my work as a relationship that always happens with an audience, then it doesn't, it's not necessarily about audience participation because I feel like an audience is always participating. Um, it becomes a series of pop propositions or to think about ideas of performativity then a series of utterances that are only, only move into action in relation to the audience taking up those utterances and moving them to something else. So. The toasts are just a series of propositions, and if anyone responds, that's great. If not, I'm just drowning out there on my own, um, which sometimes I think is art anyway. <laughs> I don't know, it's another way of thinking about it. Yeah. And that's Christian, I mean, Christian, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to comment on that. Um, <laughs> Christian, your work um, <laughs> in APT is, is very much based around language in quite a different way. Um, to Sarah, in a sense, you're not drowning, but you're you're trying to kind of recuperate um, lost language, um, and you know, in itself, it's interesting to think about even like the ephemerality of of language itself within uh, languages that that are being lost. And do you think that's an important part of what you're trying to do with your photographic and performative works um, for your works for APT? <laughs> Ephemerality, I just go. Oh, in terms yeah, of archiving just, languages or? Yes, yeah, recuperating languages, um, trying um, to recoup them. I, well, I'm actually sort of more interested in the kind of the lyricism mm -hmm. of language. And, you know, I've been making sort of doing sound works and doing kind of immersive sort of sound environments and all different kinds of things. And then <clears throat> I also just started making kind of more, more sort of music based work as well. And um, I just thought that you know, very simply that if one word of the language is being spoken, then it's not a dying language, that it's a living mm. language. And so for me, that was really the sort of impetus for making these sort of language-based works, is just to redistribute language into the sort of public realm. And um, yeah, so I guess, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And also, this, um, I'm showing these images from the um, Polari series as well, because you don't just work with your own um, language, but these riff off a language that's, that was lost um, in London. Yeah, it's a subcultural like, um, language. Yeah, slang cant. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a language that sort of belongs to the, the kind of underground, like prostitutes, criminals, um, gay men. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was a sort of, um, and I actually just really like the sound of the, the word. Um, but it was also sort of very much connected to London because I just moved to London after I sort of had, you know, finished my sort of time at Oxford. And then um, this series kind of emerged out of that <clears throat> experience. So um, it was really so different to We Bury Our Own. It kind of, um, it kind of, um, was much more sort of dramatic and sort of way more performative than, mm. um, than we, the We Bury Our Own series, but it was much more connected to just that of being based in, in London at the time, so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think there's two projects here which um, we can talk about um, that both of you have done where we come back into fully into the museum um, with performance. Um, Christian's uh, Tree of Knowledge that um, you mentioned earlier at the museum, uh, sorry, Modern Art Oxford, um, and Sarah, then we'll um, talk about um, where is the artist at the MCA, and then I think we can open to questions. I think these are quite interesting um, performances which um, touch on the idea of what is performance in the, the art museum context and those tensions between theatre and visual arts, those kinds of things, Christian. So Tree of Knowledge, just while I'm finding the image, um, you started to talk about it earlier, but what was the background um, for that work? <coughs> well, that the, um, Tree of Knowledge was, that, was my solo, um, they call it proof at Das Arts, which is your final work that you present. And um, basically I worked with um, Ivo Dimchev, who's a theater maker, performance sort of artist from Bulgaria, who's a friend of mine, and he was sort of my coach. And um, this was the, the, the body of work that I produced as my final presentation. But, um, yeah, I think whenever I'm sort of start, you know, making a performance work, I always start with generating content to put into the performance, and then that just goes, you know, comes from asking myself a range of different questions, and then this is actually sort of eight different scenes sort of montaged together. So it's a kind of combination of the personal, <clears throat> you know, t borrowing from my own personal life, for example, read, sit, laying in bed reading magazines. <laughs> Um, and then on the background there, I have a sort of monitor that has the sort of um, different sort of vignettes of um, sort of just mundane sort of things that I'm go doing during the day. So um, I'm shopping, my niece and nephew saying hello from Australia, my cat looking out the window. Um, so each scene sort of has a different kind of um, sort of action inside it. <clears throat> And did you see so, this as a theatrical performance or a visual arts performance? or How, how would you define that work? Because I think you found those tensions quite interesting in uh, terms of I your mean, relationship of with Daz Art. Yeah, I mean, in terms of it as a sort of continuation of my sort of practice, I think of it as, as very sort of still echoing some of the visual sort of aspects of my work. But it is a theatre sort of piece, really, so... And you talked a little bit about those kind of differences between audience. How did you find that in terms of the tree of knowledge, like working with that more of a theatre audience? Do you think that audience is different? I mean, and actually that's an interesting question for you, Sarah, too, because you've worked between different um, institutions and, and formats in that sense. Um, I, think it's <clears throat> I think it's really hard to gauge what, how the performance will... Um, you know, how people will respond to it. But I think there's also the, you know, for example, when I made this work, I was really strict about the context and, you know, that people weren't allowed to sort of go in and out of the, the gallery space while I was presenting the mm. work. But it was also in a weekend of live performance pieces. But, you know, the other works were much more sort of traditional sort of performance art kind of works that were sort of endurance based. And mine is really a sort of abstract sort of cryptic kind of narrative musical so you could have to sit there and watch it from <laughs> the beginning to the end you can't just kind of see bits of it mm. and, and get it so um yeah but um yeah i mean it was really well received um in oxford but um which was interesting because i thought it was quite sort of conservative crowd i wasn't sure how it would go down there's some quite sort of you know um I guess confronting scenes material in, in, the, yeah. um, in the work, but um, I prefer to actually perform in in sort of gallery context. Um, that's just where I feel more comfortable as a performer. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Sarah, in Where is the Artist, you mm. were co-opted into someone else's installation. Yes. Um, so, I'm, I've got so many responses to things that you were saying, and I've... Oh, um, but feel free to... It's um, with Where is the Artist that we're maybe flicking through. It's, again, an, another speech that goes for about 15 minutes. 
Um, this is at the MCA um, during um, a program, a performance program called Workout, and this was the work by Agatha Goth Snape, who's sitting on the f down in the front, attentively listening to me, which is nice. And um, basically, they invited me to talk another aspect of what I deal with a lot, which is this idea of um, as performance becomes increasingly po popular in, in museum culture and institutions, then um, what is my role as an artist moving into that space? If performance for me is always a space of discourse and if in terms of art history, perhaps to generalize it's historically a space of experimentation, what happens to experiment, experimental arts practice as it becomes, um, I guess, framed within an institutional context? And so Agatha and, um, was collaborating with uh, Susan Gibb, who's a curator based in Amsterdam now, um, on this project. And so this is a basically a lecture that talks, it reveals how much I get paid. Or I, I like working in, in museums as well, or visual arts context, but um, I also love working in the theatre because the theatre really value um, labour and, and human labour, and I get paid for my time, whereas in visual arts you just don't, and it's a very different way of understanding that, and it's, um, there's just a complete crossover in the way those things are managed. And if you don't sell your art as objects, which I don't, then the only thing I can make a living off is my time. So. Um, this is just me talking about that for a good 15 minutes um, in relation to how much I got paid by my friends and how little time they gave me to produce the, um, the text for that period of time. And it talks about, essentially, I'm just a hired hand. I, I fill the space in a live context. I'm, I'm not the artist, so I'm not an author necessarily, and nor am I um, the curator, so I'm not a tastemaker in this context. Um, but they also give me that platform and I could do whatever I wanted within that context. And I like um, what's also really, I think, maybe important in terms of thinking about performance and how, how I work is often um, collaboratively with other artists through collective formations. And um, Brian, and, um, not, well, Brian's just in the background. I just have eyes for Brian all the time. There he is. But um, I often work with Agatha Gosnate and Brian Fawata, who's sitting behind... Um, Agatha and Susan Gibb, and we have um, a very kind of rigorous discussions about our practices, and we often invite each other in to respond to our work. Um, in A Filibuster of Dreams, Agatha did all the slide presentations that kind of changed over a period of 10 hours with um, my text. So it's this kind of space where we've kind of used, well, I think the idea of where is the artist is that we tried to reintroduce this idea of creating a space for discussion within the museum through performance in this very traditional kind of minimalist way, I guess. You were also telling me um, that it was interesting um, to you in terms of how that was programmed in the installation and when the performance was programmed, you know, and, and it had this certain little kind of capsule of time, um, which also kind of folds into your work as a public programs person in museums. Mm. Um, can you talk to oh. us about that a bit? Um, so I have, um, yeah, I have, uh, I'm, I guess I'm also, I have a day job where I work as a public programs producer at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which is, um, Interesting because for me, because it's a it's a major government institution that is now actively employing artists to create experiences for audiences where I guess once who were once considered visitors are now considered audiences. And with a performance background, I feel um, I've walked into the belly of the beast um, on another level. And so I'm interested in how time is managed and how people experience performance in a museum context. Um, for Workout, which was at the MCA where I no longer work but used to work, um, they actually allocated a whole room to it that changed over a period of six weeks, which is a different way. And, and again, there was no, there were certain performance times but you could walk in and out of the space like an installation. So you would just happen across it. But I have become interested in this idea of um, how artists, it's very much like a, um, Andrea Fraser kind of take where how, how 
um, as artists move into institutions, I can't help but again, I, I know I'm repeating myself here, think about what our roles are and what is it that I'm offering. And now as a public programmer, what I offer is employment for my peers. That's how I think of it, like as, as an opportunity to invite other artists to come into museums and continue to work um, and, and create a space where labour, in terms of time-based labour, is then paid for, which is what public pro programming, I think, really has a strength and ability to do. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if that's a rant, yeah. but yeah. No, no, that's good. <laughs> hey, um, say, oh, sorry, uh, Kristin, go for No, it. I just thought the, um, um, you know, talking about sort of going from sort of a visual arts practice into sort of performance. I think when I was at Das Arts, it was much more about sort of turning a sort of static image into a kind of moving, narrative-driven, mm. time-based performance. So usually where you're making a photograph, you just kind of sit back and wait for the work to kind of, you know, work, work itself through sort of in your head, whereas in, with live work you have to actually physically sort of work a scene through. And so for me that was a really challenging thing to do because you're ba it's a basically a mindset, you know, shift in terms of how you generate work. And also mm -hmm. in the theatre context, usually you would finish your sort of, you know, you'd finish your masters at Das Arts, you'd have your final proof, then you would present that to a producer, and then a producer would give you money to then develop that work, and then you'd go and show that work at different theatres in, in the mm. Netherlands. So, which is a very different model to um, the visual arts sort of context where there's no production money, there's no producers, there's no dramaturgs, there's, you know, it's a very different sort of process, so. Um, that's a yeah, great segue. Yeah, that's a really good segue, I think, to um, just before we do throw for questions to your residency with Marina Abramovich, which both of you did, and which you did in the context of, um, you know, other kinds of performance um, artists, people from different backgrounds. Can you just sort of briefly talk about what that experience was, was like for you both? I mean, I had a ball. <laughs> I won't lie to anyone. I had the time of my life. Um, I approached the residency very um, clearly with this way of coming from my background of like pre-strategies for leaving and arriving home of um, I respond to the curatorial premise and then make the work always in relation to a discussion with the curator. So if the proposal was, we'd like you to be in residency for two weeks making an artwork, I said, great. Oh, in, in, in front of a public, which is what the program was. Um, I said, great, and all I would do is just be present, and that was my artwork. So kind of riffing off the marina thing. So everything I did, I considered to be an artwork. If I spoke to a member of public, it was an artwork. All my public programs, um, one of my public programs was I invited a series of seven people from different backgrounds that I've known for different periods of time to just openly speak about me. So I just did this idea of mythologizing myself instead of perhaps giving an artist talk, um, which I, I thought that I would use it as a performative platform. So I just framed it constantly like this. And I had a re and so that I think opened me up to just being able to embrace everything and, and have a good time. I didn't necessarily produce any good documentation of my artworks, <laughs> which I um, which I learned a lot from in that period about documenting your artwork. Um, but I had a really good time. I don't know. It was like art camp. It was really cold. <laughs> oh, it was it freezing. It was so <laughs> cold. I basically was really sick. The night before I went in there, I had a fever and I was like laying on the floor shaking and sweating and covered in a duvet and I was like, just like, I have to get to this residency. I was like, artists must be warrior. Um, and then got there and then it was actually, um, and then we were inside these cubicles that had sort of um, electric blankets. So I was basically fermenting in my own like disease for like two weeks inside this like freezing cold pier. It was really intense. But I mean, the whole process, I mean, wasn't, for me, wasn't that, I mean, I'm at Das Arts, we sort of had to do the same thing where we just had to sort of make performances sure. all the time. So that for me wasn't a big deal. I was just like, oh, okay, whatever, and, you know, just get up and sort of do stuff. And I already had an idea of what I was going to do anyway. So when I got there, I just produced that work and I just used the facilities that they were giving us to make that work. Um, but I think it was, I think it was very different. I think a lot of people were sort of, it was very, there were lots of different kinds of performance-based 
practices, but coming from very different areas. And I think Marina has a very strict kind of idea about what she thinks performance is. Mm. But she was really generous with her time, and she just sort of, you know, would give sort of. She was there from eight o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock. She wouldn't go at away night, every night. Wouldn't she leave was us there. alone. She like loved. Um, spending time with us. So that was also became this huge shift where the idea was that Marina, for, for those of you who, who didn't um, fly down to Sydney and race to see the exhibition, <laughs> um, Marina had an exhibition downstairs which was um, seven methods of her practice that um, a general public could come in and participate in the seven methods. And then upstairs there were 12... Australian artists living in this kind of really cold, historic pier with no windows or heating in the middle of winter. Eating in cold vegan food. The whole eating time cold there. vegan food. <laughs> <laughs> um, making work. Um, but uh, it was proposed that there was no expected outcome. So we were just going to be up there like being artists. But I guess for me, one of the questions is what does an artist who makes performance do what does that look like? Like I've, I don't have an easel. I've got <laughs> I've got nothing. All I've got is the internet. So Marina kind of every t she was meant to be downstairs working on her artwork, but then suddenly I feel like she became really enthusiastic about us as her artwork. And so she just came up and hung out with us constantly. Yeah. Wouldn't go away. She's really interested in working with young people. Like mm. that sort of. And she has a history really of so of generous teaching. in that sense, but. Um, I, we had a sort of private kind of um, tutorial and I sort of showed her one of my, I actually showed her the work that's in the ABT and I was like, oh, you know, I'm not sure whether I should mus use music or, you know, just sound or whatever. She goes, no, no music, get rid of And then she just walked off. <laughs> but um, I think she just has a really pure sense of what works and what doesn't work. So for her, she just looks at something and goes, get rid of that, just keep this. She's all about slowing down the time in the gallery mm. context so yeah and she's very image like her work is very significantly image based and um for somebody who just has a discursive practice or say for nicola gunn who's essentially a playwright it was became very difficult of like what could you see what could, could what could these artists be seen to be doing mm. like i don't know if it's possible to flick to i do have yeah. a documentation of one work that i made with marina sorry well i don't think that she's at a one sort of a gesture, a kind of performative gesture. And so it is quite sort of, um, you know, pure in, purest in that sort of 70, 60, 70 Embodied, sense of performance yeah. art where you sort of do a rep repetitive kind of performative gesture in a space for so much time or whatever. And I think from the Marina Abramovich Institute stuff that she'd shown, there were some really interesting performances in Brazil where a girl was just throwing metal around a room and it was just stick in a magnetised room. And so I think that was kind of the sort of thing that she was wanting to to. She wanted, see. yeah. But I would, I mean, like <laughs> we. I was also negotiating that, and also we were situated in a public program space, so our studio space was also interrupted by just talks, lunchtime talks, or um, school groups, or visiting, or just visiting, like which was, people. you know, fine. This is the work, one of the works that I made with Marina, my friend. Um, <laughs> this is. This is my pod where I slept in, and Marina and I had a workshop together where we decided to take the entire content out of we, being me, we just removed <laughs> the entire content out of my pod, and then I created this kind of seating arrangement for the, for the public programs that it was quite warm in there, I had heating in there, it was quite nice to sit and watch. So that's Marina, and her in the middle is her bodyguard, and then... Um, Lindsay Peisiger, who's like her collaborator on the project, and then there's a few familiar faces, and then anyway, it was it was just all good fun. That's for when me. you know you've actually made it when you have a bodyguard. Yeah, that's where you're like, <laughs> okay, now I've made it. They actually had the sort of rice and lentil thing, and I did several kind of attempts, but I sort of said to myself, I'm going to do this. Like, I have to get through this one challenge, and then I can do the others because it will just be that's the hardest one to do. And actually, took six and a half hours to do that to separate the, the rice and the lentils. And I sort of was wearing my reading glasses and I got up in the space and no one's allowed to talk. So I just sort of got up and was like, <laughs> just couldn't like, had sort of out of body experience. But um, I went up to Marina the next day and I went, so you probably heard what happened yesterday in the gallery. So, you know, I did the whole, you know, rice and lentil challenge. She went, hmm. 
just like walked <laughs> up. She was like, oh yeah, cool. And then just walked up. I was like, <laughs> um, but then she was kind of like, you know, what happened in that, you know, what happened in that um, process. And it was actually really cool because you sort of leave your body almost in that doing something so repetitive and so sort of meditative. And I found all these kind of subconscious messages coming from very deep in my sort of consciousness of, you know, have you checked your Facebook profile? Have you got that email? You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And sort of after the fourth hour, it just kind of <laughs> disappeared. But it's really interesting how programmed we are and how sort of connected we are to these kinds of, um, these kinds of influences. And I think that sort of, for me, is something that kind of, um, you know, I learned from that experience. Great. <laughs>